Welcome everyone. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Um, I'm just going to be doing the little introduction to Afikra, and I'm so happy to be hosting, co-hosting another episode of Double Exposure with uh, our good friend Muhammad Samji from Gulf Photo Plus. The idea, the reason why it's called Double Exposure is because we are pairing two photographers together to talk to each other about their work. Um, it's a really, really fun series. Our first one was a couple weeks ago with Tanya and Tomato. That's already up on the website, um, and we're honored to be able to do this with GPP. So, Samji, I'll let you take it away and tell us a little more about GPP. Um, sure thing. Um, so when Mikey and I met uh, many months ago, we talked about how we can kind of bring uh, to the fore some of the excellent work that's being done by um, artists and photographers. And I've always loved Africa as a platform. And, um, you know, there are so many wonderful podcasts and go through the archives, everybody, whether it's, um, you know, uh, uh, academic rigor on issues like Palestine or even, you know, what food is all about. And so uh, we, th we thought it was a no brainer to kind of, um, you know, bring these communities together and pair up two photographers and really have a conversation about um, what it means to be a photographer and what kind of work people are doing right now and you know uh, uh, and what kind of stories are being told. Uh, speaking of uh, photographers, we also have open editions um, and so you can see some of uh, Tanya's uh, beautiful exhibition that we just finished um, at Cal Photo Plus a few months ago. You can find those and uh, some of Tasneem's prints on our website. And um, we always want to um, share some of the um, fabulous work that's being done in the region on our Instagram and on our um, you know, Twitter feed and on our website. So please um, have a look when you get a chance. And we have some resources uh, online on our website as well, a lot of uh, previous lectures and talks that were done. So um, thank you for uh, staying with me on that. We'll start with... Um, introducing both uh, Tanya and Tasneem. And I'm very glad to have them both because I know them very well. Um, we've, I've, you know, uh, um, I've learned under uh, Tanya, uh, uh, you know, she's mentored some of uh, the work that we've done. We met actually at a workshop many, many years ago, and um, it's been great to kind of, uh, follow on this journey of being a photographer with her. Um, and Tasneem, of course, is somebody who came to Gulf Photo Plus many years ago. Um, and- uh, I mentored you too. What's that? I mentored you too. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, something like that. You can you continue to mentor me, Tasneem. Um, <laughs> so um, I think it'd be cool if we got um, Tasneem to start out by introducing Tanya and then uh, vice versa. So Tasneem, why don't you uh, do an introduction of Tanya and not um, the formal bio, but like, you know, what do you know about um, uh, Tanya? What should the world know about Tanya? The world should know that, well, First of all, thank you, Mikey and Mohammed Samji, for holding and hosting this. It's it's a wonderful event, and this is my second time to participate and bringing me with time. Like this is my my family. Um, both Samji and Tanya have literally mentored me and are stuck with me for life now. Um, Tanya, I met in 2015 when I was, I would say, a very um, baby photographer. I just photographed weddings at the time, and I was infatuated with storytelling and a lot of my work I owe to Tanya. Um, the way that I visualize things is very different now because it's not just proper documentary with all the basics and the rules. It's more emotionally investing in the people that you photograph. And instead of calling them subjects, they're humans. They're people that she has very strong ties to. Um, I'm, I'm not just influenced by the way that she photographs and documents, but how she kind of continues to document um, stories that are not always emotionally, um, I don't know, like she, she's in Palestine, she's in Jerusalem right now and Ramallah and she's photographing a lot of things that are difficult to, to understand when you're outside. Um, she's a wonderful mother, um, a spiritual mother to me, um, not by choice probably, um, and a sister. So in many ways, um, everyone should know about Tanya and everyone should take a workshop with Tanya if possible. You just made me tear up, woman. Uh, Tasneem, I, I think that uh, that really uh, her name, you know, ev everybody knows Tasneem. Tasneem is a, a walking love bomb. She enters a room. What, what should we know about Tasneem? I met her indeed in the uh, Arab Documentary Photo Program back in 2015. She was one of my first students at a time that I didn't know 
I didn't know that I would love uh, mentoring or teaching as much as I love photography. And I think that Tasneem is really part of the reason that that happens. It was a dream. She chose me. She walked up and she said, you. And I didn't know what that would mean. I mean, in, in general, it was supposed to be, you know, once a month, twice a month, some conversations. But this mad woman would leave five messages a day asking philosophical, emotive, like, and, 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 and since then, we have literally had two hour conversations back and forth while she's driving in Saudi and I'm driving across the West Bank that we'll just leave each other short what, WhatsApp messages. And it becomes like its own form of communication. Tasneem is curious, Tasneem is bold. And Tasneem partially to overcome, you, you, you meet her and her effervescence and you would think, oh, this is a woman who just moves with ease, but no. I think a lot of us are sort of wooed or seduced by her charm and her skin, but actually we, we forget that she is navigating some really difficult situations and having to charm people who have fear, who have reluctance, and yet she manages to get people at ease and to open up in front of her camera. And I think that uh, driving with her uh, across Texas, where I, I, I witnessed her literally have the audacity to bypass a state trooper and then seem surprised when it pulled us over. Uh, and then of course her charm navigating that. So the charm and warmth, uh, which is so much a part of who she is, is also, um, we shouldn't take it for granted. It's, it's, it's something that has inoculated and protected her and allowed her to navigate a very difficult terrain. So to my sister Tasneem, really glad to, to be here with you. Fabulous. Um, thank you guys for those um, lovely, heartfelt introductions. Um, so uh, I want to, uh, I do want to talk about um, very quickly about uh, both of them in terms of they're both documentary photographers. They make uh, uh, personal work, some some uh, really in-depth um, emotive uh, storytelling. And they also, um, you know, for money, take assignments. And this name right now is in Doha photographing for National Geographic. Uh, Tanya has just been uh, working with um, the United Nations uh, on a campaign to kind of bring uh, stories uh, to light um, with the Life with Dignity campaign in Palestine. Um, um, and, you know, they, uh, 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 they both, you know, do regular work on this front. So I want to start by asking um, about, uh, you know, the, the fact that you live, on, that you both live under very interesting political climates and, and contexts. And, you know, uh, um, you know, of course, uh, Tanya in Palestine and, and Tasneem in, in a very fast, rapidly evolving um, country like Saudi Arabia with all the um, changes that it's been experiencing. Um, and you know, uh, uh, Tanya, a lot of your work is about um, you know the impact of occupation on, Pal on Palestinians, or you know, for the Sneem's case, the draconian laws that limit women's rights in Saudi and the rights of minorities. And you both have sort of chosen to stay within these communities and experience what the people in your photographs experience. And you know, that's a big part of your process, feeling that pain, that joy and desire with your subjects. Um, and again, uh, 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 that's a problematic word, as Tasneem said, and, you know, um, but, you know, you operate at an equi equilibrium with them and, you know, work with them to kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, have their, um, have their, you know, challenges and their problems shared through your images and your, your texts that go along with it. Tell us about, you um, that process and how much of that uh, drives your work. I'll start with you, Tanya. It's, that was a bit open-ended. Could you narrow it down just a with a little more of a finger in the eye? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in, in some way, these projects uh, uh, find you, right? Like you, you can't uh, be in Palestine under um, living under occupation and, and not going to talk about those stories. And that's very central to um, the work that you do, because you experience that. Um, Tasneem, you too, in, in, in some regard, um, you know, we're living, I've been living in Saudi, where you've been seeing this, um, uh, you know, uh, these, these shifts happen. And also, um, you know, uh, these very massive um, seismic shifts in society, in, in society, and and um, and I guess the question is, or to 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 narrow it down, uh, um, you know, are are you um, is that something you feel like you were there and these things are happening and you have to document them, or you're actively um, you know pursuing to tell these stories because you think they're important? I you know I I struggled for years. Um, 
when I sort of broke the rules of traditional journalism and traditional documentary, because I was so dissatisfied with what I felt was a lacking representation and reality and lack of nuance. Um, and I began innovating and it, it paid off and I got bolder and bolder. And I, I also felt a bit restricted because I'm, you know, I'm not Palestinian, I'm Jordanian, I'm Circassian, I'm Texan. Uh, I am, I have Palestinian children. I, I was married living here, but, but, but that innovation, um, it, it, it limited me because I felt like this is not completely my narrative to play with. So once I began moving more towards a collaborative role that also liberated me, I was able to, to feel more comfortable you know, in collaboration, innovating that narrative, but it becomes a, you know, a delicate balance because the way it was put to me recently by, uh, by an activist here is that I have skin in the game. He said, Tanya, you have skin in the game. We're, we're, we love having you here. We love seeing how you narrate. And I think at the end of the day, when you have skin in the game, when it's your reality at home, you can't help but become part of the story. And the, 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 the balance is utilizing that, that, that care, that fact that you have a community to answer to how you represent them and how you feel. And it also allows you to innovate how you approach it, but at the same time, not letting that hijack and becoming the I. I mean, yes, there are stories that are I, but in the case of Tasneem and, and myself, I think I can safely say for Tasneem as well, the I is the shared story, but uh, it's never, it, it, it's the shared story about a sort of kinship and understanding how do we tackle this? How do we want to explain our story, your story? But it's, it's, we're never in the main focus because it comes, becomes a bit boring when you hear I, I, I. So it's, 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 it's a constant dance, but I, 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 but I <laughs> do find it easier when people find out, oh, what school do you have your children in? Oh, where's your husband from? Where is this? And, and there's an ease and comfort when, again, when the, there's skin in the game. I also have a benefit that a lot of people don't, and I'm able to, and, I, and this is where the privilege comes in, that I can access areas and li literal land, literal checkpoints, literal people that other people cannot because of my dual nationality, because of my ability to be a chameleon. When I'm around settlers or um, you know, Israeli citizens, I, I become, hi, I'm Tanya from Texas. And otherwise I'm you know, Jordanian as needs be. Thank you, uh, Tasneem. I agree with everything that she said. Uh, quoting a mutual friend, Dalia Khamisi, she always says, Tanya is married to the Palestinian cause more than she's, she's not just there, she's, she's very Palestinian. Um, I, I agree that in Saudi, for me to, to kind of address a lot of social, political, and gender and religious issues, I have to take a step back and not be very direct for many reasons, of course. Living in the Middle East, you have to kind of navigate around all those topics and, and kind of have, you know, um, tongue in cheek little gestures of like, huh, maybe throw in a little bit of comedy, maybe throw in an emotional story that's not mine. Because once it's mine, then it's me attacking. And that's how it's portrayed in our society that's very much we're very thin skinned. We don't like someone to, to share any of our, um, I guess, stories if it doesn't come with perfection. And that's not just Saudi, it's the whole region. So once I talk about anything that makes them feel less than perfect and you're attacking us and what are you doing? So I'm, I'm very much held responsible. And that's also the, the, the minus of, of being here. Um, sometimes I, I find myself a little bit resenting it that if I was Western that I can have much more access but I also understand that as a woman I have more access than a Saudi man and as a Saudi woman also I, ha I do have much more intimate access and a lot of private stories that will never be addressed or allowing a Westerner to come in so it, it's it's you know, sometimes I, I get more access and sometimes I'm restricted but it is what it is that I'm based here and I you know it's my it's my people it's my country it's my stories there we go sorry yeah i'm back i kind of lost my way here um okay great uh can you did i move to the next slide or is it the same slide nope no i am i just jumped a few slides okay so um right so one of the things that i've always admired about 
both your approaches and I think uh, I'm, and I'm kind of jealous because I think that takes a lot of intellect um, to do this is to, you know, incorporate humor and the whimsical. And I think, you know, Tanya is masterful in that and Tasneem, you know, her effervescence and kind of like her, her charm really exudes through all her, her images. And, you know, and, and, and you could see that you also employ it at very kind of sensitive stages. And I think that that is great um, because it, it makes um, some of the things that you are uh, uh, talking about quite, uh, you know, approachable in, in, in some sense. And I, and, and I know that some of these things are like, you know, innately, um, uh, you know, you guys are innately gifted in this, but how much of this, like, is it by design? Like how much of it do you guys think, okay, I want to try and find, put a, a, a whimsical spin to this or like uh, have a fanciful approach. I mean, you know, um, if, if one wanted to say, I want to be uh, a humorous in my approach with my work or introduce some wit, what would you say to people? Like, how would you do that? Tasneem, you want to start? I honestly think that it's just our character. Tanya is like, a very she's the Saudi version of she's sorry the the more westernized version of me but it's a lot of time we just walk into it and it's very spontaneous our stories that we just find ourselves into are are not always hilarious but they're always emotionally captivating um I think I mean it, it, it's very arrogant to say but we're we're natural storytellers so just holding the camera we're just sharing everything that we see with no filter and I think that's why people um it, the stories resonate with them whether it's any of my stories of the women that I photograph or with with Tanya, I think a lot of times we, we read the captions and that really pulls your attention. It kind of, it captivates it to feel, you know, some a sigh or a tear or a laugh. Those emotions are just, they're natural. They're, they're the person who's telling us that story. Tanya is just writing to you what she heard. I'm just writing to you what I've what I've seen and felt, but it, it's very transparent. And I think that's why I'm hoping Tanya agrees with me. That's why the stories are just like natural. I, th I, I realized recently, cause I was, I was teaching a workshop and I just sort of had this aha epiphany is that the, the main uh, guiding light of, of my work, it's testimony. And increasingly the visual itself is second, third, fourth. And it is the testimony I'm transfixed by what is being said. And quite often people that I, you know, I'm accessing, they're saying right off the bat, I don't want a photo. That might be the first thing that they say. And I'm like, okay, I, I just want to hear your story. And so when with testimony and, and, and that essence is the main light, you earn, you earn the place of sometimes getting a photograph, collaborating on it, finding a unique way of telling it. And it might not always be uh, an image of them. It might be a, something unexpected that tells, that gives you that emotive quality of what was, what was said. But in, in that approach, uh, I think that humor, he, black humor in particular is a coping mechanism, certainly for Palestinians, Jordanian. I think the Levant, I can speak more to, I think, uh, uh, black humor really is is a coping mechanism because it's there's just so much that is out of our control and uh, and in our region just when we think it can't get darker it just it it does it has you know pandemic be damned it's it's gone just above and beyond in recent years what's what's happening and I think that that black humor when when that coping mechanism is in the testimony is in the sort of in the natural being of who you're and in the fabric of the society that you're moving in. And in fact, it's your coping mechanism as well. And also when you're talking about, to a lot of people who have trauma and in, in the case of Palestine, quite often there's like this political obligation and people who, a, a woman who lost her child will painstakingly again and again, tell a journalist the same story in graphic detail about her child was killed you don't want to go and again poke your finger in the you don't you don't you just try to find other respectful ways to let that space open up and i since it's testimony leading me i'll come back two three times i'll wait two hours i i don't force it so the the, the image is secondary and i think that finally sorry i've had a lot of caffeine if i'm rumbling <laughs> i think finally i 
I'm exhausted as a, as a, you know, because I still make a somewhat of a living as much as freelance journalists do. I'm still ecking out some kind of living off of journalism and over, you know, a decade of assignments here, I get exhausted and weary of some of what uh, certain platforms are looking for. And I, I'm trying to push against that. And so looking for the humor is also just being sick of the hackneyed stereotypical images that don't say anything. And I'm just always looking for ways to subvert that and, and, and humor when appropriate is, is one of those uh, methods. Wonderful. I have Thank to interrupt though and add that a lot of the images that Tanya stumbles on are not by request. They just, she just walks in. She just like somehow it unfolds and a mad story just is documented by her. I think that's such a great cue to um, the next um, thing that I wanted to kind of touch upon for both of you is, you know, you, you managed to um, have a rapport with your, with, with the people that you work with and, you know, you get them to, to trust you and, and kind of share some of these, you you know, very innermost um, secrets. And um, especially given the struggles of like cultural taboos, I mean, in your case, Tanya, the occupation that limits freedoms um, and inventing these, you know, sort of made up barriers of like, you know, this religious divide, which is a political tool of the occupier. Um, and, and, you know, do you guys think that like you could be considered outliers uh, in your communities at all? Like, is, is, is that actually uh, helpful? Maybe is it a hindrance? Uh, you know, uh, because this name, you know, I'm sure when you go to some people in, in Saudi, like, you know, you stand out, right? Um, and then, you know, does that help? Does that hinder your work? Um, yes, we're both outliers or in the French version, <laughs> Um, I, I actually think that I, I, I know that I'm not someone that fits in the box. And I think that's, I don't care at this point. I, I did care when I started out in my career. And I think at this point, I, I love what I do. I'm very passionate about meeting new people and documenting the stories and following them and falling in love with them and sharing that, that love with everyone else. Like if you, I think there's a way to photograph people and show them in, while you demean them with your images, just using light and just everything that you do when you're taking someone's photo, you're taking their story and you're taking control of someone else's representation. And I, I don't care if my work is celebrated or if I'm celebrated or not. I just, I genuinely love what I do. And that's why we're struggling poor photographers at this point. Oh my God, I just had like this like super ADD moment because <laughs> my son was in the background. Could you say that, just surmise two seconds of the question again? Forgive me. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you think um, that you sometimes uh, run the risk? Uh, of outlier, outlier. outlier. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, definitely. And uh, that began long before photography, you know, visiting Jordan in the summers or then when I would live there on and off, it initially was something that was hurtful. And then I came to understand, you know, the bitterness when a cousin would, would be outraged that I was able to stay out later or do something that they couldn't, you know, the um hajnabiya, you know, her mom is foreign. And I realized, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to use that. I'm going to run with it. I'm going to break the rules. And, that's, and, and again, so it's, there's a lot of restrictions when you live with duality and you don't fit in, but then you can learn to make it work, to make it work for you. And I think in... And the case here, I, I think I am able, well, on a practical level of privilege, I'm able to access. But even beyond that, I think people, there's enough familiarity and feeling of respect. I, I believe when I'm inter interviewing people and people end up who are initially reluctant, letting me photograph them, I think they feel on the one hand that I understand and that at the very base level of ethics and humanity, there's no, like we're on the same page regarding occupation, et cetera. So we're able to just go more immediately to the more human aspects of the story. But I also think that because I'm slightly different, there's even an element of feeling comfortable to share certain things. I mean, you know, when you're looking at places in the West Bank and the, and the literal limitation of space, even people who are in therapy are afraid to well, they're afraid to do therapy locally because that therapist is going to know their aunt or cousin. And so there's this move of actually in Beirut, a lot of Palestinians are doing online therapy with Lebanese uh, 
therapists who probably need because of what's going on lately, a lot of therapy themselves. But I think that in that sense, the being an outlier and sort of insider or outsider at the same time is, is helpful. Great. Um... I don't think there's uh, many talks where we actually don't talk about, you know, the political being personal and, um, you know, the personal being political. And, and I want to uh, hone in a bit uh, in, uh, within an aspect of that. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, knowing your work intimately, your portrayal of women is very, very potent. And you both produce quite feminist work without actually calling yourselves, um, you know, feminist or the work, uh, feminist work explicitly. And and I think uh, there's a lot of um, feminist meaning to the work without it being contrived or, or, or trite or, or stereotypical. Um, it it kind of almost feels that a lot of your personal life seeps into your work in a sort of sub subliminal way. And is that something you use to take the work further? Is it something that resonates and it feel like you want to bring it out there? So when I applied to the ADPP program and Tani was my mentor, actually, this idea was uh, very much instigated by you, Mohammed. I remember this in Bangladesh in the Chobi Mel. <laughs> um, I remember you sat next to me and you said, you know, you're a divorced Saudi woman. You should talk about divorce. You know, and, and also you're a wedding photographer. And I was very resistant. And then I applied to the ADPP, which Tani became my mentor. And I remember to this day that Tanya was very much pushing me to photograph my own story and include my voice because I didn't want to include my narrative. I wanted to photograph everyone else's story, just not mine, because um, as transparent as I am among my friends and loved ones, it's very difficult to kind of open up that to that extent with people you've never met. Um, so I, I resisted for a while, but I did include myself. And I think that's why I can share the stories of women with divorce in regards to love, being widowed, to say that I'm one of you. I have the same narrative. I have a similar experience. I'm a single mother, you know, so you can open up to me. Um, with regards to getting a little bit political, a lot of changes have happened in Saudi recently, but up until 2000, up until a year and a half ago, um, as a Saudi woman, since you're born, you have a legal male guardian until you die. And your legal male guardian is your father, your eldest brother, if that's not around, your eldest uncle. Like you'll always be restricted from traveling, from renewing your passport, from getting married, getting divorced. So that's why documenting all of these changes, I didn't know that these changes were going to happen so fast. So I can't, I'm very happy that I photographed that. I, I photographed women not being able to drive and all those emotional restrictions are sometimes much more defined and, and much more um, strict to kind of go around. So it has to be personal. I can't say that I'm against, you know, women not being able to drive, but I can say that regardless of women not being able to drive, they've still continued to being lawyers, doctors, journalists, etc. So in terms of the personal, you know, in the years that we've had the Arab documentary photo program, which I think has been a game changer. And uh, it's like a miniature uh, MFA program in our region. And I think it's really helped put, along with Gulf Photo Plus, um, it has really helped put documentary photography in its rightful place in our region. And it's only, it's only rising. And in the years of that program, I'm always pushing my students to get per personal because, you know, if you're just coming from a sort of outsider journalistic, are you really able to get something different that's already been narrated? And that magic of coming up with something unique and, and new, it really only happens when you, you, you get personal and whether you're, it's the personal motivation and, and there's an emotive element to what's motivating you and, and you seek out or you sprinkle a bit of yourself. But, you know, for, for example, I had a, a, a mentee come and say he wanted to do uh, a project on uh, a mosque in, in Egypt. And uh, I was like, okay, well, why? Show me what you have. And it was, you know, pictures of the imam, pictures of people praying. And I, I just didn't see anything there I, that hadn't been said a thousand times. And so finally I kept pushing him, well, well what's your motivation? Why, why are you doing this? And finally it came to light that uh, he'd fallen in love during the revolution, the woman he ended up marrying, they'd both been in the Rabih massacre. And, uh, and then after they'd married and things started to change rapidly in, in Egypt, uh, they took very different positions politically and spiritually. And his four-year-old son 
was at the age where a decision was going to be made. Is he going into religious studies or, or public, quote unquote, secular? And I said, well, I think that's your motivation for this project. And in the end, it ended up becoming this amazing, unique project of letters to the son, letters to the four-year-old between the wife and, and himself. And it became collaborative and deep and wonderful. And I think that I'm always pushing uh, students to, to go personal. And I think in, in our region, we have to, because our stories, you know, you look at the documentaries in our region, every single one of our students, whether it's in Libya, uh, wherever it is, there's always this sometimes horrific loss personally felt by the photographer, a, a great grandfather that was uh, assassinated on and on and on. Our stories are more complex. And so when you bring in the personal, it becomes almost a map to follow. And, and I think our stories in our region, when I show, when I show them to students in, 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 in Europe and the US, they're always amazed because I think we're coming up with a new way of narrating here to circumvent the literal political restrictions that we have. So I think that good work in general is personal. And again, not I personal, but, but that's when, when the magic happens. And uh, where I'm narrating, there is no act, sadly. Sometimes you just, you almost want to break from the political. Uh, I always think about Walt Whitman when he got angry about a, a, a critic who was waxing sentimental about a poem of his. And he was like, no, the poem is about a damn flower. But here, it's never about a damn flower. It's just loaded. So I don't really have a choice. Fabulous. Um, you know, uh, uh, speaking about personal uh, issues, I think that brings up a lot of kind of taboo subjects. And you both uh, seem to be very comfortable um, in kind of navigating that and gravitating towards the fringes, uh, you know, towards those who are on the kind of margins and fringes of society and finding space for that in your project. So whether, you know, in Tanya, uh, uh, in, in the Sacred Space Oddity, um, you, you had a, you know, a number of images that looked at uh, gender or the kind of occupations appropriation of religious symbolism and, and language as a means to an end. And, you know, Tasneem, you looked at um, male guardianship, single mothers, um, you know, parenthood. Did you, why, you know, my question is really, why do you feel that that queerness was a space or a lens from which to see those projects? Like, what does a, a trans or non-binary story uh, tell you about the occupation or about interpersonal, you know, relationships under that kind of, you know, political uh, uh, framework? And is this something that, you know, you're actively seeking to kind of uh, tell these more complicated uh, stories? I think in my case, you know, one, one of the things I'm trying to do is uh, in our region and Palestine in general, you know, we're, we're flattened, seen as a very homogenous, simplified version. And we have a secular society. We have, we have a lot of interesting things happening here and people who reject uh, the binary that's put on them and gender is, is one of those ways. And so I'm always looking for characters that subvert the expected but also in all of the, 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 the limitations of space and being and sort of Kafkaesque bureaucracy of uh, uh, Israelis in your bed, in your head, I mean, what it takes to navigate your reality here. I think that I, I'm also looking for people that are, that are having an, um, even another step to go around. And I think that, like, for example, uh, the character in this image, uh, mm -hmm that the, she, she, sorry, she, they, she was the first they that I ever encountered. And they were you know, educating me on the concept of this fluidity of, of, of gender. And, you know, years of working here, I never incorporated images of Israelis, like the you know, uh, occupied pleasures, the occupation was there, you saw its structures, you felt it, it was, the, with this project that is now uh, being made into a book, The Unholy Land, AKA Sacred Space Odyssey, I also am going a step further and finding Israeli bodies and examining their privilege and their questions and dissent. And uh, I just think, uh, you know, whether it's in Palestinian society or Israeli society, I think that people that are struggling with the right to express who they are uh, are some of the most interesting characters because they're having to subvert and deal with yet another layer in an already very restrictive place. 
So I met Kali, who's in the photo at a wedding, a Bahraini Indian wedding, and she was the wedding planner and she presented herself as Khalid at the time. And she said, in one week, I'm going to leave Saudi. She's Saudi and I'm going to leave Saudi to go to seek asylum for gender. Um, um, to, to, yeah, I, I forgot the reason, but like basically if you go to Italy, they will cover the expenses for therapy, for the surgery, for everything. And in five years, you will become an Italian citizen. And I thought, as a Saudi woman, I'm so restricted um, because at this point, we couldn't drive, we couldn't do a lot of things. We're so limited that it was just mind boggling that someone wanted to leave their body of being a man and switch and trans to become a woman. And so I, I followed her in her hometown in Saudi. And then I followed her even to Italy and spent a week or so with her. And I'm still, you know, kind of following and keeping in touch. So that was one of the reasons that I want to include her in the same project of, and then there were women that explores Saudi women uh, and their lives. And also about a year ago, I met a, I mean, I'm, I'm, I have many of my friends who are gay in Saudi and they will be the first to tell me that we have an easier life as a gay man than as a Saudi straight woman because you, it's very easy to hide and not present yourself um, as uh, a homosexual. So for me, I wanted to kind of explore that. As And so anyway, last year I met a friend who was gay and, and the first thing that he said, where are you from? And I said, from the Eastern province. And he said, ha ha ha, you must be Shia. And I said, yeah, I am. And he just went, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Because of course he meant it as, something negative and I was like no no I'm I'm very confident about me being a Shia you know it's it's I exist and I'm fine with it if you asked me when I was 16 I might have lied and said no I'm not in the same way that you are now in your 30s and if I asked you are you gay you must be you'll say yes and he said oh true and now we're very close friends but like that that kind of established why I wanted to photograph um, a marginalized group that doesn't really exist, especially in Western media. And when they do, it's always like, oh, look, they exist here. And it's, I don't know. So it's, it's. I don't think this this project itself will be exhibited or presented in, in the next 10, 20 years maybe, but I do want to document that they have yeah. existed. And there's no way to say that the Western world has liberalized, you know, and, and made them come into to the surface. So that's my reason of why I, I want to photograph my every minority there is. Um, last uh, kind of uh, set of questions and then we can move in. You know, uh, um, Tasneem, you, you seem to um, oscillate between photography, social commentary, and, you know, to do that, you sometimes, I mean, it's clearly in that picture dress almost like a male photographer, I don't know if that's subconscious or not, but in the same way that masculinity and guardianship is a role performed by men in Saudi, and, and you know, bear with me here, like indulge me here, but you'll, you, you, you're kind of also embodying their role and their perception of this kind of male professionalism. You're pretending to be someone to extract a re reaction and a result is really kind of interesting. And I've seen you in action, right? And uh, uh, in, in photographing. And if you come just as yourself, you may not have the same kind of access in, like in this evening, wherever you're photographing, I think it might be MDL Beast or whatever, but um, uh, you know, you, you might have been a distraction to those you're photographing, and I can see what you're doing here, or I'm guessing, you know, that that might be the case, but is this, you know, is this something you consciously think about and kind of like insert yourself in that uh, situation to blend in, or is it subversive? What's, what are you thinking? You know, is it um, undercover journalism, or is it a kind of performance art, and, you know, uh, um, Tell me more about what you're thinking when you I don't I've never really thought about it as a performance. It's just happening all the time. <laughs> but um so I mean this was the first concert ever in Saudi and um it was only seven thousand men and I was photographing this event for the New York Times and I have this ongoing personal kind of anxiousness and also trying to um, to prove to the West that I can do this and you don't need to send a parachute white male photographer to cover the story. So they sent me there. And as soon as I go through, um, I, I mean, I already have a press pass, but even then I'm restricted because the Saudi guards, uh, the security guards are afraid that as a Saudi woman, I'll go there. This is December, 2017, I think. And I'll be photographed by Saudi men and it'll go on Twitter and they'll be fired. So they didn't allow me, but 
I wasn't dressed as this. I actually wore a abaya and depending on where I am, if I'm in a small town, I'm going to wear hijab. I'm not going to wear colorful clothes. If I'm in a big city, I can pretend to be someone who's a Westerner or, you know, a, from the Levant. Or like I, I can, I, I'll shift and dress appropriately to wherever I need to navigate around. In this, in this story, though, I did ask the Uber driver who was very kind enough to give me his baseball cap and hoodie and um, I, I snuck in and, and the men did notice that I was a woman because of my nails and my earrings and they were fine. They, I think a lot of times we're just cautious and very scared of what could happen, but thankfully I've been, I've been you know, alhamdulillah, nothing has happened yet. Um, Tanya, same kind of goes for you, right? You also shape shifting through your many identities, whether it's like this white Texan American, um, you know, uh, the the bubbly kind of um, you know vivacious Texan, or you know, just to quickly, I guess, define it. Performance art isn't just the medium that uses the body and is created through actions performed by you, but also a way of engaging directly with like social reality and the politics of identity. Are you playing this role and getting to see someone else's like unfiltered reaction towards, I don't know, a friendly non-aggressor white person. So, you, you know, in a way to kind of get some insider information um, or is this really just about safety and access? Like, you know, um, like, is, like, I'm always fascinated by how like interesting it is to see what people might behave if they actually, you know, how people might behave if they knew that you are, uh, your proximity to Palestine, like, you know, that you have Palestinian children and your, your, your views towards that, like, you know, uh, um, and, and, and knowing you, I almost think that there is this like performance art, right? Like you, you, you love it. And, and, you know, or, or am I wrong? You're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I had a full scholarship for theater that I sometimes still regret not pursuing, but I also knew theater may be the one thing that led to more poverty than photography. <laughs> and I had too many other interests. So, but theater is definitely a part of it. And I, I find that, especially when you're working collaboratively and getting people to engage in their representation uh, um, and not for this image, there is a curtain, but curtains are a big part of it. And uh, it almost becomes a form of art therapy and play. And when you're willing to play, you open up a mischievousness and actually even just the mischievousness, the gravity of a situation removes and people are more willing to, to participate. And then it becomes the photography, just it's a gift, it opens up. So yes, uh, and yeah, I do, especially working in a place where, where whether it's a, a Palestinian police officer who's being uh, uh, aggressive and, you know, a bit patriarchal and subverting that with, with, with whichever identity I need to, or I, I can say a quick anecdote. There was a, for, for this book that I'm working on, there was a, there's a group in Israel called the, the, the New Temple Movement. And they believe that the third temple needs to be mounted. Where else? Of course, it needs to be uh, on the Dome of the Rock, nowhere else. It has to be right there. And so they're really right-wing, frightening and aggressive. And I was trying to access for a long time. And finally, one of the leaders of the, of the movement, she agreed that I come to her house and I had to enter this gated community. It was right in the Mount of Olives, deep Palestinian neighborhood. There were men with guns outside protecting them, protecting them. And I entered or I knocked and she was like, I know I entered this sort of very American accent. I know I told you that you could come, but I'm so exhausted. I've got so much laundry. And I was like, oh, I'm a mom too. I understand. I'll super help you do your laundry. Just let's just chat because I wanted to get in. And so we go in and indeed there was the biggest pile of laundry I've ever seen in my life. I was shocked and it was musty and it smelled. And it was actually an old Palestinian house. And that was, you know, disarming. She made me a cup of tea and I actually became later quite quite ill. I had to visit the loo quite a bit. She offered me food, I, I refused. Um, Anyway, as we sat and I started folding together, within a minute she was on her phone and then another minute she was off. And I was just sort of sitting there like a stupid boy folding her laundry. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? But then I was like, you know, uh, I'm learning. I'm, I'm literally access to, so they always talk about dirty laundry. Well, in this case, there were prayer clothes of, of two-year-olds, which I didn't even know they designed that, little, little white outfits. And there were holes in them and yellow stains. And I was just thinking about I've been to refugee camps across our region, almost every single one. And no matter the poverty, I've never seen clothes that were in this bad of a shape. And I, then I, as I spent more time, I, so it was a clue. And then as I spent more time with her, I saw her standing 
staring because she could see from the window the dome of the rock and she was just standing and staring and it was the understanding that this physical world didn't matter to her and so that was the entry point in you know shared foreign mother but then once I had all of the images that I wanted I got a bit brazen and the more political and pointed my questions became the more suspicious she became because initially I was like yeah my husband's from the Galilee I just kept it open so I didn't lie I'm American, not a lie. I never lie. I just share certain truths, certain aspects. So once I started to ask the personal questions, she was like, where did you say you were from? And we were in her bedroom. Her two little children are there. And part of me is one, scared. I don't want the, the, the guards to come in. Two, I want to keep getting more. And three, at the end of the day, she's a mother who suddenly looked worried and afraid. And so I just said, yeah, 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 he's, he's from the Galilee. Where from the Galilee? And I was like, uh, Tarshiha. And then at that moment, she understood. And she was like, is he, is he Arab? No, 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 no. She said, is he Muslim? And in fact, he's, he's Christian, you know, but I, I don't like to play that game because of the divide. Uh, they, they, they really try to separate. But in this instant, I, I played the word game to ease her. And I said, he's Christian Arab. And then she sat there staring at me and she said, are your children dark? <laughs> that was her next question. So, I mean, in these situations, it's absurd. And the theater, sometimes it's so ridiculous. Like when I, I actually, on, uh, on a Settler Road, I, I went halfway off with my car and the car was like this, because I drive to Sneem Kinatas quite erratically. And when the Israeli police came up, I just was like super frantic text. I was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I just was like driving fast and I was excited to be here in the Holy Land and I just wasn't paying. And the guy was just like, oh my God, get out of here. So the performance one is functional, but two, yeah, there's a bit of subversion and playfulness there. Great, um, let's see. I think there are uh, a couple of questions. Um, and then I have some in case uh, we don't have questions, but um, this is lot of uh, who's asking if do you think that the documentation of stories make a change in your society or is it that you are already you're documenting changes that are already happening i don't think that anyone in saudi is waiting for me to document them to make a change um i'm just documenting things as they are and alhamdulillah they're changing so that i'm i can't take any ownership of that to be honest what about you tanya I, I think that good storytelling, if you're documenting a community, it's, I, I sort of see it as internal and external storytelling. It, the story should resonate with the people that you're documenting. And uh, at the same time, in my case though, I, I, I'm looking at occupation and structures that, that need to change for basic tenants of, 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 of the most basic of rights. And so I am hoping, I, I'm not under any delusion that somebody's gonna look at one of my stories and, you know, just suddenly, you know, oh, amen, hallelujah, I, I see the way, but I'm hoping at the minimum, maybe I have just more practical, lowered my standards of hope, and the longer I stay here and see increasing ugliness, I think I have to lower my standards more, but at the very least, I hope that I can make a dent in the assumptions. I mean, Palestine is a place where in the Western eye, it's just rife with assumptions and demeaning generalizations that are simply, and, and, and fact, just things that are not true. And so I am hoping to, again, subvert opinion, at least make a gray where somebody assumes that they know what is black and white. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I don't think I'm under any delusion that, that I can directly make change, but I think that I can help contribute. I think, I think the greater the greater success or hope that I have for making any kind of positive change, be it in our own societies or otherwise, is, is actually through my students and through what I'm seeing is a really exciting, unique rise of a, a very specific Middle Eastern uh, new documentary style that's coming out in photography as one of the main mediums. Great. Um, I think uh, I'd like to um, quickly go here uh, and maybe end it on this note where you share um, 
we'd asked you in advance of this call um, to share a picture of uh, of the of the other person and why you love it. So uh, maybe uh, Tasneem, you want to start um, by telling us why you what and Tanya because uh, Tanya doesn't know why uh, that Tanya know, doesn't know that you chose this, but why you like it so much, and then vice versa, and then we can end on that note. I find a lot of images from Tanya are very romantic and a lot of them are just, they're very appealing visually, the color and the contrast and the movement. And they're just like, I want to know more about their story. I, I remember she shared why, and a lot of her stories I know by heart now, I can tell you each caption for every image. This is the least one that I know about. And it's, it's one that I don't remember anything sad. So that's why I kind of chose it because a lot of her images are just heartbreaking and they they I, they're unforgettable so that's the one that i i chose that i want you to share more about that's funny that you say that because this was one of the few assignments it was an assignment with npr on the samaritans the sort of uh, god there's almost impossible to describe the sort of lost 13th tribe of jews but they live uh, in nablus and they're actually in the palestinian parliament they speak fluent arabic uh, very interesting. And I, I was given an assignment on one of their most holy days and I had to arrive at two in the morning and, and walk through the sunrise with their scrolls and chants. And it was one of those assignments that you're, you're bewildered in the best way. It's something new. And of course, there's this, you know, for someone who's become quite cynical, there is the spiritual energy that was just seductive. And um, at the same time, uh, there's a lot of jokes about the Samaritans because for a long time, they, they can only marry other Samaritans. And there, there's a lot of, uh, there was jokes that there was a lot of inbreeding and that they all supposed to have really big ears. And then when I was there, I was like, oh my God, it's true. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of, you know, and then, and then a couple of years be before, I don't know how many years exactly, they started to allow, um, I don't want to say my, male order brides, they're not that, but women from Russian, uh, former Russian communities to come in and marry, to diversify. So it was fascinating because it was the men that were covered in samarial robes. And the women, many of them were actually wearing short, short skirts. And uh, they looked actually, some of them uh, like, not the Russian ones, but the ones that had always been in that community looked more like uh, Egyptian films from the seventies. And when I talked to them, they were like, yes, you know, we, we like to differentiate ourselves from our Arab neighbors. You know, it was just, it was just, it was fascinating. And while I was there, so there's always the story that you're documenting and you're capturing the magic because the assignment was the ritual. So that's, for example, one of the images of just after the ritual, just after sunrise when they were done. But then I'm always looking for the subversion for my own personal project or what interests me. And I ended up becoming friends with the, one of the teenagers in the community who was into psychedelics and was giving me a whole other view. So this is actually, you chose a very rare, happy, beautiful image that that wasn't so layered with uh, with dark politics that's interesting you found that one uh, Tanya why did you choose this one what do you want to know about this so I was looking at Tasneem's feed and a lot of her stuff is is weddings you know bread and butter and there was another one I almost chose of this magic you know there's these three men walking through this sort of flower floral community with such purpose but then I thought well at the end of the day it's a wedding and I could, there could be a meta read, but, but I struggled. And then I came to this one and I was intrigued because of her writing, that it was an assignment from, I, I wanted to know more about, cause it seemed like an intelligent assignment for one from a US publication. Uh, and I'll let Tasdeeb talk about it. So it was the basis of the assignment that interested me and the idea that knowing Tasneem and knowing how this assignment, cause I know the publication came to be, she probably had to go on the street and hustle. And again, it's difficult enough to get access uh, on the street here. I imagine it's even more difficult uh, in Saudi. And so just the amazement of how, you know, the, the ease this, with, with how she's laying and trusting her. And then also to get a portrait. She really managed to make it a portrait. The eyes speak a lot. And so, yeah, it was the assignment itself. And she could speak a little bit about that to Sneem. So this assignment was for Refinery29 and they wanted me to document and interview women and their opinions about Trump choosing Saudi to be his first country of choice to visit. And it was, all, everyone I interviewed was very anxious and worried and they didn't want to be named because 
you know, if our country is welcoming him with open arms, then how are we going to share our actual thoughts of us being very frustrated and angry and hate? I mean, everyone in the world should hate him. Um, but this is before we even knew what trash he'll bring to the world. But anyway, so like I couldn't, I was very limp. I couldn't find anyone. And then I, I worked with a Saudi writer, which is actually this woman. And I asked her, can you please help me change the story and shift it to something we are all willing to talk about? So we talk about how we perceive America instead of usually the other way around is how America perceives the rest of the world. And I was amazed by how many smart, independent individuals were very much political and intelligent, and they knew more about America than what America perceives itself to have. So each of them have different and independent captions. And with her, she, I mean, I have even more um, like, you know, middle finger photos <laughs> that was like sent directly to Trump. But um, with her, she want, she chose to wear the niqab. And we wanted to kind of flip this again, romanticizing women wearing the niqab and how everyone is usually fetishizing them. When I, to be honest, when I post any photo of a niqabi, I usually get double the likes of a Saudi girl without wearing hijab because it's like oh she's so pretty and, and she's smart oh my god that's not how we perceive Saudi women to be so um that was her photo but yes I I, I love the fact that you read the caption before and and that's why you kind of went towards this photo yes if you take anything out of this talk please read captions <laughs> Uh, no, I, I want to. Uh, I think this is a great place to kind of uh, end and, and and wrap up. But uh, thank you so much. I know you guys have had so much on your plate with everything um, that's going on um, with your work and personal lives. And um, uh, I know that you know Tasneem, you're an assignment, and 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 Tanya, you're in the middle of assignments and things. So thank you, thank you so much for being part of this. Um, uh, thank you, Afikra, for the space for making this happen. And um, this will be shared on, you know, on YouTube and on uh, uh, your podcast uh, apps. Um, but I'm going to ask uh, Mikey to come in and just kind of conclude and uh, say uh, goodbye. Thanks, everyone. A huge yeah, thanks to, to Hamad uh, and the GPP team. I know Rama's on the call as well. This is, for us, a dream collaboration. We love working with the GPP team. So, um if you don't already follow uh, everyone on the call, please do so. Uh, Tanya and Tasneem's um, handles are what you would imagine them to be. And, oh, I can put uh, them up, actually. Yeah, if you put them up, that'd be great. Um, and this will go up on our podcast feed and on YouTube in a couple of days. We've got three other events happening this week, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And if you happen to be in New York, we are going to be uh, hosting live in-person interviews with artists who are performing as part of the Habibi Festival um, at Joe's Pub. So that will be st happening starting tomorrow night. If you happen to be in New York, come by, see some great live music, and then you get to see me uh, yak it up on stage with the artists. All right, everybody. Bye.